service will continue with the sermon. Again, the sermon is based on a reading from Malachi chapter 4, the entire chapter for those following along at home. And for those here, you can again follow along in your worship folder. And we'll begin with this prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. The songs of Christmas often encourage us to be filled with good cheer. They tell you to picture scenes of bells jingling and children laughing and playing and singing, sugar plums, which I don't think are a thing anymore, peppermint sticks though, we like that, especially peppermint stick ice cream. If you've never had that, it only comes out this time of year and it's fantastic, but I'm getting sidetracked. Those songs talk about all those fun things that are supposed to fill us with cheer. And they encourage all of us, universally, to put away anything that divided us from the past year and to get on the same page and have one season that is filled with peace. And that's a really tall order for simple Christmas carols. You can't just unplug from the responsibilities and the pressures of life by plugging into the pretty and resplendent lights of a Christmas tree. The healing that is promised at Christmas doesn't come from the lights on your home or on the tree. The healing of Christmas comes from the Christmas light. There's a difference between somebody who fills up on Christmas spirit with cookies and eggnog, sitting in a room that sparkles and shines and glitters, and somebody that is filled up by the Spirit who feeds your soul with His Word. Words like these from John chapter 1. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. John the Baptist and his powerful message of repentance and forgiveness and driving the people to look at Jesus was far different from the mainstream message of that day. The people noticed that he was different. They listened to the words that he said, and so John had to constantly point the people away from himself lest they start to follow him as the Savior and also point the people away from themselves. John the Baptist and all the people were born in darkness, the darkness of sin. They could not save themselves. Now, I'm very sure that the darkness of sin will probably never be the album title for some celebrity Christmas album. But it is the truth. The darkness of sin must be addressed, especially this time of year, to show the difference between darkness and the light. The words God spoke through the prophet Malachi shed light on the sins of Israel, the sins of the people of his day. In Malachi chapter 1, he gives very clear and vivid examples. The prophet wrote, When you bring injured, lame, or diseased animals and offer them as sacrifices, should I accept them from your hands? Says the Lord, Cursed, cursed is the cheat who has an acceptable male in his flock and vows to give it, but then sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord Almighty, and my name is to be feared among the nations. God had clear rules to the people of Israel about what kinds of animals they were to sacrifice. Animals that were not diseased. Animals without blemish. Good, the best animals. And really all of this foreshadowed Jesus as that perfect unblemished sacrifice. But instead, the people were bringing whatever they had just lying around at the back of the sheep pen. It would be like this. Actually, no, it would be worse than this. It would be like you going to the county dump to get presents for your family for Christmas. 
And he goes on. You have wearied, made tired, the Lord with your words. How have we wearied him, you ask? By saying all who do evil are good in the eyes of the Lord, and he is pleased with them. Or where is the God of justice? The people of Malachi's day were short-sighted. They saw the evildoers around them, and it seemed like they were blessed. God didn't care that the people were running rampant, that they were evil and unjust. They got caught up in the temporary blessings that those people were enjoying. And so they even questioned God. Why don't you immediately punish these people for what they are doing? But rather, God is patient with people of all time. He's patient with those that are evil, those that are lost, that at some point His word would work on their hearts, that they would be saved. Because God has no desire to destroy the wicked. His desire is peace and love for the people. God also, though, does say that He will punish those who do evil. It may not come in this life, and indeed we know the worst punishment comes after death in that eternal punishment of hell. Malachi continued for the people. You have said it is futile, useless to serve God. What do we gain by carrying out his requirements and going about like mourners before the Lord Almighty? But now we call the arrogant blessed. Certainly evildoers prosper. And even when they put God to the test, they get away with it. Here the hearts of the people were finally revealed. They were tired of serving God. They were tired of repenting for their sins. They didn't see any point in denying their sinful nature. They didn't see any point in walking around mournful and always apologizing and being sorry to God and admitting that they were sinful and lost. They didn't see any point to serve God and to show love to others, and care about others' needs above their own. What point was there? It doesn't seem like God cared. When the evildoers put him to the test, nothing happened. They didn't want God's promises of good on His terms for them. They wanted good in their eyes to be done for them now by God treating Jesus as if he were a genie or at this time of the year, someone who just delivers you whatever you want out of the clear, thin air. And so God made it clear what the results would be for those that mock him, for those that turn from him and chase again after sin. And this is where our reading from Malachi 4 picks up. Surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. Stubble would be like the really, really dry, fine little materials that you would use to start that Yule log ablazing. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble, ready for burning. And the day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. It will be all-consuming. Nothing will be left that they will be able to go forward or have any kind of lineage. This is complete destruction. Malachi says this is for those that criticize God, that stand in judgment of God, that He is not immediately carrying out punishment on those who do evil. God says there is a day that will come where they will receive full, just, and complete punishment. Don't worry about it. I got it covered. The same warning also stands for those that would then, not in pride, but in jealousy, in envy, in temptation, would join in then with the evildoers, having no fear of God then. And he says, it still stands that one day I will bring full punishment to those who do evil to keep us from giving in, for losing our fear and faith in God. And so there is a clear division made 
at Christmas, you and I so easily would trade going to a party with Christmas cookies and coming to a church service to receive communion. Jesus' body and blood for our forgiveness. You and I so easily teach our kids jingle bells instead of Jesus' blood shed for their sins and for ours. You and I so easily bring just what is left after filling the bottoms of our trees to put a few things at the tree that Jesus was hung on. You and I fantasize about playing out our inner sinful desires rather than faithfully following the footsteps of those believers that are recorded for us in Scripture. Certainly, this time of year, certainly at Christmas, there is a clear division that is drawn. There are those that are waiting for the things under the tree, and there are those that wait for the one who was hung on the tree. Not waiting for the day of the Lord, giving in to half-hearted worship, not using your gifts to serve God and others, not scheduling time to be in God's Word, being jealous, envious of unbelievers, being impatient with God for not giving you exactly what you want, exactly the time that you want it. These temptations are real for us, as real for us as they were for the people of Malachi's day. And for all of those times that you unwrapped the temptations and you indulged in whatever sins were inside, for all of that, there is real punishment for you. Punishment that Jesus took for you. The good news of the dividing day is the healing that it brings. There are many days that we can consider as dividing days in Scripture, and certainly Christmas is one of them. There's a clear division at Christmas between the light and the dark. On Christmas, the light of the world, the good and perfect. God's pure Son was born, a man to destroy the darkness that holds this world. Malachi wrote, But for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays, and you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. Jesus' coming is the healing that you and I needed. Jesus lived each day of his life worshiping God. He used all of his gifts for God's glory. He used all of his gifts to serve others. He was always compassionate and kind, and he was patient. He was patient to wait for that day where he would not take advantage of any of God's blessings. He was patient to wait for that day where instead he would only receive God's wrath and anger and punishment, punishment for you, for your sins. Certainly for each dark temptation, for every sin that makes your heart a block of stone instead of a living heart of flesh, and perhaps this time of year then, a block of coal ready to be burned in the fires of hell, Jesus has forgiven you, and your sins are gone. Jesus lived every day of his life good and perfect in the right way. That's why God calls it righteousness, and that brings us healing. And note here, this is what the real healing means. Yes, Jesus did pay for our sins, and they are gone because he took that punishment. But it's not as if he just sutured up a wound, as if he pulled out whatever object and closed it up so that now there is a scar there. No, the healing that Jesus brings to you is that, yes, he has pulled out whatever was hurting you. Yes, he did bind it up, but there is no scar now. There is good and new skin. That's the complete healing that Jesus brings. Not only are your sins gone, but you now have His perfect good record that doesn't affect just a few spots and scars, 
but it affects your whole body, physical and spiritual. This is the complete healing that Jesus brings to you. That is the good news. That is the sun that rises with healing in his wings. So that when you go to heaven, you are forgiven. And you are completely set free from your sins. And you stand before God with this good record. Good and perfect and righteousness. This is what fills you with joy. This is why the prophet says, You will run and frolic like well-fed calves. Carefree. Trusting completely that God has you and will protect you from all things. To live in heaven with Him in joy and peace. Remember what your Lord has done for you until the dividing day comes then. Again, there are many dividing days in scriptures. Another one is that final day where Jesus will come a second time to separate between the light and the dark, believer and unbeliever where he will take his people home to be with him in heaven. Malachi, John the Baptist, and the rest of Scripture were written to keep you ready for the healing that is coming on that day. Malachi went on to say, Remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him at Horeb for all Israel. His basic message was, remember the Scriptures. Remember the Bible, the Word of God. He says, see, I will send the prophet Elijah to you. Again, this is John the Baptist, often called the second Elijah. I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. God's promise was to send the people a second Elijah, to again call the people to repentance and to show them the forgiveness of Jesus, the light of the world. And that happened. Jesus was born. He lived. He died. He rose. He ascended into heaven. And that message has continued to be passed down generation to generation. And many have believed. Parents and children have shared that joy of their faith together and their Savior, Jesus. And as you wait, either parents waiting with children, children waiting with your parents, the Apostle Paul gives you good encouragement so that when that dividing day comes, you are found on that side with the Lord. The Apostle Paul gives us practical encouragement for this in 1 Thessalonians 5. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the Spirit, do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good, reject every kind of evil. Whatever this Christmas season, or this past year, or your life has left you feeling, you have every reason to feel joy. Real, true, lasting joy, because Jesus is your Savior, because Jesus is that greatest gift. Whatever traditions or decorations surround you this time of year, do not get lost in the temporary cheer, but be filled up by the lasting joy that comes from knowing your Savior, the true meaning of Christmas. Parents of any age, of any age. Here is your practical advice to model for your children. Again, rejoice always. No matter what happens in your life, to show them that there is still joy in your heart because you know that all things are taken care of because of your Savior Jesus. Pray continually, not just in church, not just before meals, but throughout the day, throughout your life. Model that for your children. Teach them how to pray to their Father in heaven. And in doing so, you show them how to be thankful in all circumstances. Trusting His power and His presence are always with you. Children, remind your parents what they taught you. Not to quench the Spirit, but to let His fire burn. To get lost in the Word, not in the world. 
to always use God's Word as that guiding light. That no matter what influences come into your life, it rises and falls by what God says in His Word. And encourage one another then, as a family of believers. This time of year, all of these Christmas songs, they encourage good cheer, they encourage us to be happy and joyful, they encourage peace on earth. But there's a difference between those that rely on the temporary and the tinsel to have a little flutter of joy in their hearts, and those that sing Christmas songs about the darkness of sin, and then the light that came into the world. Jesus, that saved you from sin and death and hell, who gave you the greatest gifts of forgiveness, life, eternal life, and heaven. The dividing day will bring healing to those who remember the Lord. Amen.